So I'm here today with Ujjal Basan, who has kindly agreed to do the interview at his house. Today is the 4th of January, 2024. Uh, we're going to sit here in this beautiful place and at various locations inside the house and uh, talk about uh, life in general, about words, books, a little bit of politics, creativity and all that. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Absolutely delighted to meet you in this way. <laughs> so let's let's go back to an earlier, younger Jal who was in India at that time. Where did you spend your early years? Earliest. Let's go back to the earliest times. For well, the earliest um, four or five years, I spent um, in my village, the Sanjkala. Um, with uh, my family, my father, and, uh, and my mother was still alive. And then I think um, I must have been five. Uh, my uh, nanna, my maternal grandfather, had come to take a, a bullock cart, gadda, uh, from our village. Uh, with, and you can switch into Punjabi if you want. Yeah, to. with his oxen. This is a mix. You know? So, so Urdu, I had a gadda land. Yeah. I had a lot of mystery. I had a lot of mystery. I had a He put me on it and he said, I'm, I'm going to take this kid with me because he had no children at home. Okay. Um, and uh, and so I remember my mother, uh, I remember her giving me makhani, behi roti de utte paake. Um, and I, that was the second last time I saw my mother, uh, because then I think a couple of years after she passed away. Um, and I only saw her a uh, second time because uh, she went to visit my nanna and me in, our, in, in his village. And, um, and after that, I never saw her. Um, so I remember my childhood. I remember being on the cart from the Sanj Kalan to my Nanna's village. And uh, how old were you at that time? How old did you think you were? I was uh, uh, at that time about five, I think, when I was taken from my village mm -hmm. by my Nanna. And then I then my mom passed away. I was in grade two. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I think, eight or less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then progressing from there. Well, I I, you know, I did my uh, chauthi jamaat from my nana's village. Uh, uh, in, so, interestingly, he had he had established that school uh, without going to the government, hoping that the government would take over right after independence. And I was in the first class of that school. Um, my number was seven. And, uh, and um, incidentally, it was in the, in the courtyard and a large sort of building uh, left by some of the Muslims who had gone away to Pakistan after partition. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful place with a big courtyard, a lot of mango trees. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting under them and, uh, you know, on the mats and doing classes and learning to read and write Punjabi on the ground or on the fatti. But you had to sit on the ground on mats? Oh yeah, uh, mats, on mats, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. There, was a, there was a new thing in those days, in grade two or three, uh, they were able to uh, get um, uh, 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 fatta made, uh -huh. uh, a, a bit of a pedestal. Okay. For, uh, so you had to buy that from the village carpenter. And, uh, and sit on that? Or yeah, on yeah. That? It was like it was about four or five inches high, um, you know, with two arms and then flat and on it. What were you writing on? Oh no, you did, you sat on it. Okay. Rather then, than on the mat. And then what did you write? Was there well, a writing? Uh, either either you wrote. Well, sometimes you wrote on the ground. 
right? Okay. Other times you rode on slates. Takti. Slates. Takti. Uh, uh, or phatiya. Phatiya was the takti. Yeah. Jadiyam, okay. lakdi diyam na jadiyam. And then every day, you know, you'd go home and unu saaf karke. Gachi. Then gachi loni hoote utte. Then my, uh, that was my childhood. Like, 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 like perhaps your childhood. Yeah. <laughs> good very interesting so when do you move on to from that to regular a uh, regular school uh, from that was with the chauthi jamaat karke na then uh, uh, my father brought me to the village because uh, pind school se ge chauthi tai vi se ga lekin panmi to 10vi tai vi si te then oh jada panmi to 10vi wala school si na interestingly pehla school mere nana ji ne shuru kita si ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪੰਜਵੀਂ ਤੋਂ ਦਸਵੀਂ ਵਾਲਾ ਸਕੂਲ ਸੀ ਸਾਡੇ ਪਿੰਡ ਉਹ ਮੇਰੇ ਫਾਦਰ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਚਾਰ ਫਰੈਂਡਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਹੋ ਕੇ 1930s ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਐਸਟੈਬਲਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੀ ਨਾਨ ਪ੍ਰੋਫਿਟ ਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਰ ਨੋ ਗਰਲਸ ਵਾਸ ਇਟ ਜਸਟ ਫॉर ਬॉयਸ ਇਨ ਦੀ ਐਲੀਮੈਂਟਰੀ ਸਕੂਲ ਦੇ ਵਰ ਗਰਲਸ ਬਟ ਦੀ ਦੀ ਹਾਈ ਸਕੂਲ ਫਰਮ ਗ੍ਰੇਡ 5 ਟੂ 10 ਵਾਸ ਜਸਟ ਬॉयਸ ਬਿਕੋਜ਼ ਵੀ ਹੈਡ ਅ ਸਕੂਲ ਅ ਹਾਈ ਸਕੂਲ ਇਨ ਦਾ ਵਿਲੇਜ ਫॉर ਗਰਲਸ ਸੋ ਸੋ ਦੇਰ ਵਾਸ ਨੋ ਨੀਡ ਫॉर ਅ ਕੋਐਡ ਐਟ ਦੈਟ ਟਾਈਮ um but but grade 1 to 4 was covid okay yeah so then you're moving on from there well from there um i did my dasmi and then there is a college at fogwara rangwade college at fogwara mere father ne mainu utthe dakhil karwa deta te pehla kehnde si te to doctor hi karwani hai last wale din nathe nathe aaye kise na gal karke aur nahi kaka kehnde doctor di zindagi bahut badhiya nahi hundi hai aur raat nu jadon vi mar jao to unj gal lende hai tusi engineering karni hai and i was so dead set on you know doing uh, i read all the books on physiology biology all of those things yeah. um in the holidays and um and then i was kind of somewhat um disappointed and and never really dug into the books after that mm-hmm. in india mm-hmm. uh, so much so that uh, i flunked uh, chemistry um in uh, in pre university which was grade 11 the first year college and i had to rewrite that uh, exam um so me too <laughs> chemistry <laughs> chemistry i could tell you know so many c's and h's and i mean and i i just couldn't do that so then you know i rewrote that uh, and then i was doing pre engineering second year college um before after pre engineering if you did well you could get into an engineering degree or you could uh, use that as first year bsc and do your bsc mm. um but right in the middle of it uh, because i was disenchanted and uh, disappointed at our own poverty my father you know we weren't the poorest in the in the fam in the in the village oh, but i i um, got disenchanted and and uh, luckily uh, for me uh, a friend of mine was coming to england and i happened to just bump bump into him by chance uh, and i asked him because he said this is our last time until we meet next i said <laughs> what's happening to you <laughs> and he told me and then he shared the address of the college uh where he sought admission to go and so i wrote to the college behind my father's back and made the application got money from england behind his back sent the draft yeah. he caught the admission letter and then he was so angry with me so unhappy because he um wanted me to stay he wanted my older brother to leave because my older brother didn't want to study <laughs> he said look you could study you stay here he can go um so anyway i had to persuade him through my brother my he always listened to my older brother he never listened to me so <laughs> so uh, my brother was able to persuade him um and so that's how i uh, you know got the ticket to come to england um and in england i really didn't um you know have money to study so, so when you say came to england where did he go and did he come for studies or what oh i i my cousin my first cousin my tayal son o england i was in 1956 there and then he picked me up at the airport and uh and uh i went to bedford um uh, near luton just past jabot luton and um you know i uh, got a job uh, in derby uh on the trains um shunting trains you know when you the 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 goods trains yeah yeah 
they come and then you have to break them and then they go into different okay. cities, right? So I was a shunter, uh, breaking up those trains and making new ones. I did that for almost six months until I realized that um, for some technical reasons, because people who had got me the job had lied about my date of birth and everything. I couldn't present my certificates uh, to the college to do my beer, to do my courses. So I took off and started a new back in Bedford and uh, and you know got, got all of the dates of birth everything rectified okay. and started uh, legit as they say okay so you, your name dosanj comes from the village yeah the, the village is dosanj kala it was settled by dosanjes okay how far back does it go about 500 years ago okay yeah it was settled it came from another village um, which was uh, Pwadara, that who which had gills and dosanjas. I think some people got mad and got angry and had a fight and five brothers left and settled this new village. And so it comes from those five brothers. Wonderful. So now we are moving into your uh, education in England or are you going back to India? Well, in, in England, I, I did my O-levels. Um, uh, Two or three of them, um, uh, studying by myself or night so, classes. Uh, when do you get introduced to literature and books? Were there books in your house? Well, my my uh, father uh, had done FA back in nineteen late twenties. Um, that's why he established a school, and uh, that's FA English. And then uh, he had also uh, done Punjabi Gyanni. Um, so he was, in a sense, a linguist yeah. and knew, law, knew Urdu mm -hmm. and, and some Persian. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and there were a lot of books at home. I mean, there was Hamlet, there's like Punjabi, Gorky's translation into Punjabi, and there's, there's uh, uh, Munshi Premchand's translation yeah. into Punjabi. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were a lot of books. And my, my father would always bring books from the library to read. Mm -hmm. uh, while he made us sit at the table in the, with the um, you know kerosene lamp to read at night, study at night, he would read novels and stuff like that. So your awareness so. of literature as an entity comes from that point. Oh on yes, I mean history. I read I read Gorky's mother in Punjabi in grade six, mm -hmm. and Nanak Singh's novels yeah. galore, mm -hmm. and uh, also later on. Uh, this other novelist, Kamal, his novels, uh, which were sort of leftists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I read a lot. In England, I read a lot, actually. Even if I didn't understand, I never, I rarely picked up a dictionary, although I bought one the first few days I was in England. But I rarely kind of looked at it um, because I realized that if I kept looking at dictionaries, I would never understand. Mm -hmm. So I just kept reading, kept reading, because I wasn't doing exams. Uh, so it was okay if I missed something. Mm -hmm. And then I listened to BBC radio, uh, not music, BBC One, mm -hmm. interviews, mm -hmm. news, mm -hmm. debates, dialogues, um, Security Council debates and things of that, that nature. They used to be very important in those days. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's how I learned English. I, I, I read and then I realized how the words are pronounced. Mm. So I never went to school to learn how to pronounce English, mm -hmm. either in England or here. And, uh, and, uh, and then I, you know, read a lot in those three and a half, three and a half years I was in England. Um, and then I came to uh, Canada in 1968. Okay. You know, I, I worked on so many jobs, and, but I, the one constant in my life in, in Britain was uh, no matter what I was doing, I was listening to BBC radio and I was reading. I was reading something. Um, I also tried my hand at writing Punjabi poetry uh, because my father destroyed my poems I had written in Punjab because he thought, you know, poets go hungry, they never make any money, uh, generally speaking. So, uh, so there's a practical approach. Oh, yeah, he didn't, he didn't want me to. Uh, didn't want me to be a writer, obviously, <laughs> not a poet. Sure. Uh, I was a lab assistant, and then uh, I, was, I was working in a car parts factory. Um, I mean, did so many jobs. And then my last job in Britain, I, a group of friends uh, set up a new, established a new Punjabi weekly, uh, lit, somewhat literary news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They named it Mamta. 
And uh, they ca- they said, look, you come and help us and we make you the assistant editor mm-hmm. and we'll give you a weekly uh, stipend, right? So, and free lodging. I said, oh, that's great. So I was in Eng- London for the last three and a half months of my life in East London, uh, Plasto. Um, and I was writing editorials and they would put their own name on it. And I, I was supposed to be collating the paper and mailing it out to the various grocery shops. That was a way of distributing them across the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was essentially what I did. And um, in the process of that, I had applied to go to universities and I never received any response from any university because I had, didn't have any A-levels. Mm-hmm. I was trying to get in as a mature student. So I got one response from uh, University of, uh, um, it was uh, Newcastle Underline. Uh, and uh, it was a new university, University of Kiel, established around the same time as, as SFU. Uh, it was a young university. And the dean actually wrote back to me and said, you know, we'd love, to, we'd love you to come for an interview. <laughs> and uh, so I did. I went for an interview. And, uh, and they said, look, um, I wanted to do um, double major. They used to call them combined degrees in Britain. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to do law and politics. And, uh, and they interviewed me and uh, said, look, uh, everything else is great. Um, uh, but, you know, you don't have any sort of history or politics O levels. Uh, in Britain, um, if you can come back with British history O level, um, uh, we will give you admission next year, guaranteed. Um, and, you know, I came back and I went back to my friend from the school where I used to be a lab assistant, uh, the history teacher, and got the syllabus and books. And I looked at the books and I couldn't tell one Queen Elizabeth from another. <laughs> I couldn't tell King George from the other King George. I was like, because I can never learn by rote. And history is such a thing that you have to remember dates and names and places at least, right? Mm. Um, and uh, so I was so depressed uh, while I was editing this paper and write, you know. Uh, mm. uh, so I was in London during those days. And uh, one day I noticed, I was walking by Trafalgar Square and I noticed the Canadian High Commission. And I walked in there because my Masi had been here since the 50s. In Vancouver? In Vancouver. Okay. She lives about 10, 15 minutes away from here mm-hmm. still. And, uh, and so, and she used to send me these beautiful cards. And I thought of those cards and I, I thought, this is a depressing place. I, I should go, right? I, maybe I'll be able to study there, right? That, that was the thought. So I walked in with all the papers I was carrying. And there was nobody to speak of in the office except those who worked there. So it wasn't a busy office, obviously. And the guy who came to the, the reception to say hello to me just grabbed me and said, look, you want? Yeah, I said, I want to go to Canada. OK, we'll fill out the form. We'll do this. I said, I have no documents, right? He said, no, don't worry, but you bring the documents. And so he said, he, he, I got, gave him all the info because I, also, I was also an audiovisual technician. I could repair uh, 16 millimeter cameras, um, and, uh, no, uh, projectors, because I'd taken a course to do that at the as, when I was the lab assistant. So they said, okay, well, well you are admitted. You, you know, th- you're provisionally accepted. Here's your medical requirement. Bring your passport, bring these documents, and you're done. So I brought them like three, four weeks so later. So which year is this? Huh? Which year is this? 1968, early 68. Nobody used to come to Canada in those days. They thought Canada was six months dark and six months day. Of course, they were talking about some other parts in Canada, not this. So I was, then I was ready to come. So I left this newspaper business part way. And the only, the only public evidence of me departing England was a, 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 a kind of ironical uh, slap at the newspaper that I had left behind saying, he said, uh, this this Des Pradesh was the paper which turned out to be a Khalistani later on. And he used to write really foul language the same way as Tara Singh here used to write. Very foul language for each other. So he says, Ujjal Dasanj, Mamta was the name of the paper. He says, Ujjal Dasanj, Mamta nu sile de dina ch chadke Canada ravana. So it was a little tiny mm-hmm. uh, news somebody sent me after I had. 
Hmm. That was the only public evidence of me leaving leaving England. There is a record. Huh? There is a record there. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, I, that I left. Um, and somebody else sent me a clipping of that afterwards. And uh, so I came here, and uh, I went to BCIT as a lab lab assistant or something. They they told me I was overqualified, and some people would tell me I was underqualified, and so uh, finally we settled on my uncle was uh, was a, a lumber grader at one of the mills at the foot of Yukon Street here uh, in Vancouver. And uh, I was living with him at mm. that time uh, mm. for the first six months with my Masi and Mustard. Mm. And, uh, you know, finally, industrial first year attendant the course Karla. St. John's ambulance was the course at Kambi, near Oak Ridge. Um, I would walk from his home, which was on 58th and Ontario. I'd walk from there to all the way to Kambi and uh, wow. uh, 43rd or 4th uh, every day and did the course in five weeks, passed it. And then he got me the job um, uh, as, a, as a pulling lumber on the green chain. 10 cents an hour extra because I was the first year attendant because they had they had more employees during the day. They needed a first year attendant. So I was permanently on day shift. So I was able to then start going to night school to do my BA uh, at King Ed uh, near where the where now the uh, Vancouver Hospital Extension is uh, on Oak and 12th. Yeah. King Ed used to be there. Uh, you still have some pillars in the fence there uh, uh, of the old old okay. school. Okay. Um, and I used to go to night school there, take two buses and, you know, go and um, twice a night, twice a week. And I did uh, that way. I completed half a year of my BA mm. um, during, during night school. And um, and then I got into, you know, I had an accident at work. My lum my back broke. Um, and I, Sorry. oh, my back broke. I, I had a disc, uh, how, damaged how disc. How did that happen? And pulling lumber, heavy lumber, very heavy lumber, like that wide, that thick, 20 foot long, 30 foot long. And you pulled it, you pushed it, you kind of, yeah, you know, yeah. like, you, you know, when you pull lumber, you do this movement. So the discs wear out, mm -hmm. right? My discs may have been, you know, may have been worse than others. So they wore out and got damaged and I had to have an operation back in 1970. So I have two screws in my back. Oh, uh, so I'm screwed. <laughs> Anyway, I um, so then I couldn't go back to lift heavy lumber, um, and that basically sped up. I was thinking of doing another year of evening classes uh, so that we had some more money. My my brother and I had bought a home. Our uncle had helped us, so we were renting part of it, living in the other part. So we were kind of doing okay. I thought I'll do another year of work, but my back injury basically said no you can't do any more was, work there was no workers comp at that time oh it was oh, there was. oh yeah but it was like yeah. nothing i you know like i i was doing physical work i was a healthy young man for the rest of my life i'd never be able to do heavy, heavy work again and I, I wasn't qualified to do anything else they gave me 19 dollars a month at that time like <laughs> yeah um anyway this is the 80s this is 1960, oh, 60, 1970. 70, 70. Yeah, this is 1970. 1970 was my operation. So they gave me $19 a month pension. Um, and, uh, and I was, and then I argued with them and then they bought me two, uh, two semesters books at Langara. <laughs> in addition to that. And um, anyway, so that's how I, um, I got back to full-time education uh, in January of 1972. Okay. And, and, then, and then, then, uh, then January of 1970, sorry, no, January of 71. Uh, and then January of 72, I went to uh, SFU uh, to finish the last two years. 
I was at Langara to doing my two years, okay. and then um, then at SFU in four semesters, I I finished um, the two years that I had to do honors, um, taking overload of courses. Uh, and September of seventy three, I also started law at UBC. Um, I left one, went into the other, and um, I completed my law in seventy six. Um, and and during that time, you know, I was a bit of a rebel rouser on the farm workers issues, on domestic workers issues, and um, janitorial subcontractors, all of the people who were being exploited, um, and uh, and so. You know, we, we set up a farm works legal information service before the farm workers union started. Um, we did all of that, and then eventually, uh, when I uh, was called to the bar in '77, uh, I set up my law practice with a friend of mine and uh, started practicing law. In the meantime, I had married Rami um, before I finished my BA. I, in fact, had a year to go in my BA when I when I had met her at Lingera, and uh, we married. And uh, until I got married, my brother put me through school, and when I got married, she put me through school. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lucky guy. Um, was already always there with me. Um, I was um, I was active. Um, back in England, when I was, uh, we set up a Young Indian Association to, for the integration of immigrants back in Bedford. Then I came here. We did the farm workers advocacy. We did the janitorial workers. We I spoke at at the temple many times about democracy and ethics within the community. Uh, I spoke out against the farm worker farm contractors, and and so you know my activism was always there about equality, about social and economic justice. And then when I became a lawyer, we, when I was articling, we set up this Farm Workers Legal Information Service. And then I had just become a lawyer, um, and I was still um, um, not practicing law with my partner um, when I was asked to run for the NDP because I had become a member of the NDP back in 69 when I was working in the lumber mill. Um, and uh, and um, they knew that I was a bit of a rabble rouser, so some of the older people in the NDP came to talk to me and said, would you run for us here? Um, and uh, that's how I then ran first time in April of 1979. From in, which place? April, May, uh, Vancouver South. It used to be a dual member riding. Yes. And uh, and even then, the conservative mem part members of our community uh, didn't like me because they called me Maoist and all that kind of stuff. Because I used to hang out with the Maoists back in the back in sixty eight, sixty nine when I first came here. And uh, but I quit because I thought I found them violent and irrational. I just said, you know, these guys are. <laughs> Uh, and so it, that's how my uh, life kind of took shape. And when I ran in, in 79, I lost the election. Dave Barrett was the leader of the party at that time. And uh, then I ran in 83, I lost. And then I actually took courses, uh, took a typing course. Um, I'd been reading a lot, novels and stuff, and like, for instance, the trilogy, uh, Dawn Flows Home to the Sea in, in that trilogy. Um, I read that, and I, you know, I, I Resurrections by Tolstoy, because I was a reader, I, I loved reading. Mm. And I wanted to write a couple of novels they were, that were in my head by that time. And in 80, late 83, uh, having lost the election, I uh, took a core typing course. And within a couple of days, everybody else was like half a book away, and I was on the first chapter or second chapter. So I couldn't type. I couldn't learn to so type. When you say everybody else was... It was a, it was a typing school oh, at, okay. at Langara. Okay. So I went, took a typing course, right? And uh, and so I, I decided typing wasn't for me. You know, I thought of dictating, and my secretaries would do it. it, it it's not the same thing. So um, then, of course... 84 happened and I was still kind of thinking I I would write a paragraph in hand and you know never got anywhere then 84 happened and um, and June of 84 nobody said anything we didn't say anything and then and then of course um, you know um, 
they went and and they had hit lists and they would call who, people who is up. they the khalistanis okay. the, the instant khalistanis there were khalistanis here before 84 but they found, now found more currency because of what happened at the golden temple so you know there was a demonstration of 20000 people in downtown denouncing the government of india and that's fine i mean i no problems with that and then one day i'm sitting at home and they go burn the tricolor and they had a running battle with the rcmp at the consulate's home in west vancouver um when they were trying to do the flag raising ceremony and then there was a reception in the evening i was invited to both of those events i never used to go um and and i knew a lot of people used to go for a cocktail circuit right a lot of free scotch to drink and all that stuff um but that day um because i was watching at home uh, the helicopter had to be called in to control these guys there was they, they had a running battle with the police um at the at the consulate's home um and i was down with a back injury so i was home watching the news mm. i'd been invited to go mm. i never went to the morning ceremony mm -hmm. um then you know i looked at what happened and i obviously it moved me i mean mm. what had happened in india had moved me and then what happened here at the consulate moved me even further like you know you you're fighting you're you're burning your own tricolor from which my grandfather mm. and his oh. uncle sacrificed their lives so I went to that uh, that evening reception and and then I spoke to a journalist there who said you know is nobody going to speak um from the community to say anything and that was my kind of um you know um entry into thinking whether or not I should say something uh, I decided I should so a week later I held my first press conference uh, and then I was into the battle so whom were you representing in the interview i thought i was representing the silent majority of the sikhs <laughs> and you, you thought you were yeah but what was it taken as oh that's how it was taken as yes yeah but but it but others some others in the khalistan movement probably took it as this guy is an agent of the government of india or something mm -hmm. right whatever so it, mm -hmm. that didn't bother me at all mm -hmm. uh you know i don't mind being an agent of a country i love like Yeah, that's not a problem agent in a good sense not in a bad sense uh but um but uh, so that battle started i joined the battle and that continued until um 8990 um there wasn't uh, a statement that they put out on action they did that i didn't challenge because one it divided the community two it created hatred three it promoted violence four it hurt the sikh community back in punjab uh because the vast majority of them never wanted khalistan uh and the vast majority of the sikhs here didn't want khalistan either so you know that and then there was the 88 election uh i think 88 or 89 i can't remember which the provincial election which i had to sit through i didn't run um and uh and then even the 91 election i think i i only ran um it was just a coincidence um i was home i was making tons of money i was making in those days i was making quarter million dollars a year 1978 79 no sorry 98 90 1989 90 from your law practice from my law practice um and uh, and i had three sons the eldest was about 15 and i needed to have money to raise them and educate them and um but uh, something happened um that Uh, made me run um there was a meeting uh, in china in in the in punjabi market sitting home and uh i was injured back in 84 85 with an attack on my head which broke my fingers on my how, right hand how and, and why because of my views on separatists and khalistanis and violence and all that they came to kill me and and i survived <laughs> um This i had i had 84 stitches in my head and my fingers were broken on my hand um yeah in vancouver behind my law office i was getting out of my law office coming home for friday night and um and uh 
you know, I heard footsteps uh, running towards me. I thought some kids were playing in the alleyway because my car was parked next to the alley. And the next thing I know is I'm fumbling for my keys uh, to open my La Car, tiny little car. I had two bags full of files because I had a Supreme Court trial starting Monday. Yeah. And then um, thump, 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 I got five or six uh, dumps, uh, you know, uh, um, hits on my head with this iron bar. That you were all had. alone. I, I was all alone, and uh, and I saw the chap. He was like six foot three, six foot four, tall guy with a beard, and I didn't know the man. I'd never seen him. So it's just one attacker. It's just one attacker, and uh, and my luckily my partner had followed me out of the office, and he came and he yelled and screamed, and the guy ran away. And I was taken into the doctor's office, which was almost next door, and then taken to the hospital to, mm -hmm. to get stitched up. Uh, anyway, so, so, and that had kind of, you know, um, caused some concern about my safety all my life. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then in 91, um, 89, 90, there was a meeting at, um, at Pablas on Main Street here restaurant. Uh, Harcourt was the leader. Um, they had invited over 100 people from the indo Canadian community and some of the other local NDPers. Um, and I was sitting at home. I didn't know about the meeting. Um, <laughs> and I happened to be at home. And uh, right from that meeting and gathering the cups of tea, uh, a friend of mine walks over to my home, which is because I lived a block and a half from that restaurant. He said, oh, you weren't there. I said, well, where? I said, I didn't know about the meeting, yeah. right? So, so we talked and uh, and he said, well, I asked somebody why you weren't there. And they said, Ujjal Dasanj is politically dead. And if we run him on an NDP ticket, uh, we would lose 10 seats because he can influence 10 seats by 2 to 5%. Um, I kind of, you know, I was shocked. I mean, I, I knew I had enemies, but I didn't know somebody thought I was politically dead. Mm -hmm. um, so that got me thinking. And I thought and I thought and I thought and I, I decided in my own mind, you know, elections aren't the only way to affect uh, life. Change. Change. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been, I was doing that before elections. I was, I've been doing that all my life. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I wasn't focused on elections, but I wanted to make sure that this narrative of Ujjal Dasanj is dead didn't take hold. Because I thought if it, that took hold, I would never amount to anything in life. I'd be a good lawyer, I'd make lots of money, but that's, that wasn't my aim in life. I wanted to be a bit of a change maker in my own way. And if people think you're dead, you can't make change. So I had to prove that I was alive. And that was election season. So I thought, no, no better way of proving your your uh, life, relevance, uh, being relevant. being alive, being yeah. relevant, than fighting for a nomination. And uh, so I picked the riding, uh, Vancouver Kensington, and uh, I signed people up. When they realized that uh, I was signing people up, my wife didn't want to support me. My kids were unhappy. I told them, that's a different story. I'll, if you're interested in that discussion, I'll, I'll tell you. Because the, the kids were interested in the money. They, want, they said, look, we want to go to school. You'll have no money. Mm -hmm. In politics, there's no money. And so we, had, we actually had a discussion. My 15-year-old my said to me, he said, Dad, I thought you'd grown out of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and my argument with them was, I said, look, We'll give you enough money to go to school. But at the end of the day, I don't want to be like most immigrant parents where they put everything into their children and the children turn out to be duds and they look back and say, what did I do this for? I didn't even follow my own dreams. Mm -hmm. I said, so I want to follow my own dreams too. So that's that was that discussion. And Rami didn't want to support me either. She, she said, look, I mean, you've done enough. Um, but then when I started signing up, Khalistanis became active in the riding. When she heard that, she said, no, I'm going to come out and help you. So we signed people up. We had the first nomination meeting. It was disrupted by the Khalistanis. It was taken over by force by the Khalistanis. Which year are we? It, it was, we're talking about uh, late 1989, early 90. And, uh, and uh, uh, 
so the, all of the Khalistanis from all of the temples in the lower mainland, even from as far away as, you know, Kelowna, were here to oppose me. And they had signed people up in the riding. And uh, so the meeting was disrupted. Police had to be called in. The meeting didn't take place. The meeting was rescheduled with proper security. Uh, and um, I defeated all of the Khalistanis. They had a they had couple of other candidates, and they were like, I think, 300 votes. And I had over 200 votes just by myself. And within the th uh, amongst the three of them, they had the other yeah. 70 or 80 votes. And um, so I resoundingly defeated them, so much so that uh, uh, um, Vaughn Palmer called, called it the Battle of Kensington, because the name of the riding was Kensington. <laughs> Your political life is taking over your, your professional. Yeah, yeah fine. I, I ran, so I ran uh, in the 1991 election. Uh, I won. Um, I wasn't in cabinet. Um, and in 93, there was a cabinet shuffle. I mean, I, I uh, chaired uh, a committee on recall and initiative. Um, and um, um, so in 93, there was a cabinet shuffle. And before that, I um, um, chaired a committee on recall and initiative. Um, and uh, and um, uh, in 93, in the cabinet shuffle, I wasn't um, put into cabinet. Although Harcourt had dinner with me and, and Joy McPhail, jo Joy McPhail went into cabinet, I didn't. And I decided at that time it was important for me to spell my priorities out. Mm -hmm. So I held, had a meeting with uh, the premier. And I told them, I know you're going to say ethnicity, gender, geography, all of those things get into, a, mm -hmm. you know, cabinet. But um, I want to tell you that I will not be running in the next election unless I'm, I'm in cabinet well ahead of the next election. And he wanted to know why. I said, look, I used to pay more in taxes as a lawyer than I'm making in salary as an MLA. Mm -hmm. If I'm not being useful, I don't want to be around. I'd much rather go, go back and make some money. And uh, so I was put into cabinet at the earliest possible uh, in 94. Um, and uh, I was made the Minister of Government Services. Soon after I was made the Attorney General, I had um, the Attorney General in those days used to be the Solicitor General and the Attorney General, all of it under one ministry. <laughs> and also I got the extra charge for liquor, excise, and for human rights, multiculturalism, and immigration policy. So it was like a huge ministry. And um, so I was that for over four and a half years. I was the Attorney General, um, if I might say so myself, a fairly popular one, one of the most popular AGs that BC has ever had. Um, and, you know, I um, wasn't planning to run. The other, the, the other premier had to resign. I had to ask him to resign. That made me a bit unpopular within the party. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when the time came for leadership, um, you know, many members of the cabinet and the caucus told me that they wanted me to run. Um, they didn't see any other alternative. So I ran for leadership. Uh, I almost didn't run uh, because I didn't want to. Power has never kind of attracted me by itself. There, there has to be a purpose for power. You can't just yeah. be only after power. So I said, I'm not inclined to run, but then I ran, won the leadership, became the premier, and it was a short-lived premiership. I knew that, and I knew we were going to be slaughtered. When I became the premier, we were polling at 12% in the polls, and when in the election we polled, I think, 23%. Um, it, it was bad, um, but that was, <laughs> wasn't necessarily my doing. We were, we were going to die anyway. Um, and then after that, I, I basically took a year off, um, started painting the house, doing furniture, you know, varnishing things and, and doing nothing for about eight or nine months before I went back to the practice of law. My uh, middle son had by, by then become a lawyer. Uh, my elder son, eldest son, was going to become a lawyer. Um, and then I went back to practice with them um, until 2004. Um, when um, before that, uh, Paul Martin came calling, Prime Minister Martin, and said that I wanted to, he wanted me to consider running with him as a liberal. 
I wasn't a liberal federally. If you become a member of the NDP, you're both federally and provincially an NDP member. But then I hadn't been uh, active in the NDP for almost uh, four years. Uh, hadn't been a member either. And uh, I decided to go with uh, Paul Martin to defeat the right wing conservatives. Uh, for me, it, it's about the relative positioning you have. I'm not an ideologue. If I was going to be an ideologue, I would have stuck with the Maoists back in 1969. Um, so, you know, then uh, I was the Minister of Health for over a year, year and a half, um, or two years. I can't remember the exact period. And then several critic portfolios. Um, and, and I don't regret any of those things in the sense that, um, that when I went federal, for the first time I realized how fragile this country is. Because every time you have a discussion about any general issues, mm -hmm. Quebec is at the table. Whether or not Quebec is there, but it's at the table because you have to make sure that Quebec goes along as part of the Federation. And and sometimes you get angry at that because as a British Columbian, you say, well, you know, Quebec gets all the attention, gets everything. But then you kind of, because I was in federal politics, I realized that Canada is different from the from North, rest of North America. Partly it's because of Quebec. It has to have, it has to learn to, to adjust and accommodate a huge minority within itself. Mm -hmm. And when it has to do that, then it becomes sensitive to other minorities and other differences and how you accommodate mm -hmm. uh, each other and all the differences. And I think that makes Canada a better place. Yeah, it's much more difficult to govern, but still a better place. So, I mean, those things you would have never learned uh, not being in federal cabinet. So I was wondering how you got into your literary career. When did it start? You told me earlier that you had much earlier thought about writing, but then gave up on it for some reason. Well, from time to time, you know, I still wrote Punjabi poetry. Um, every now and then I'd be sitting there, I'd write a poem. I may I have about three, four hundred poems kicking around somewhere. In, in spite of your father's yes, oh, advice? Because, to... Oh yeah, because when I came to England, <laughs> I started writing again. Um, and there were some published uh, in the first um, Canadian book of Punjabi poetry. Mm. A couple of uh, my poems were published. Um, but I never kind of really wanted to be a poet, not because my father had said so. It, I didn't think I wrote deep enough poetry. At least that was my judgment. Um, and I, um, after I uh, was retired by the public in 2011, um, in the election, um, this house was under construction. Um, and uh, it, it had been framed. Uh, the, the first two floors. This mm. frame, this floor hadn't been framed, mm. and I became the janitor on the uh, on, on the construction <laughs> site. And Rami became essentially sort of the, the practical manager. We had a builder, but we sort of as soon as it was um, um, this this was built and mm. and there was a roof on it, we started sleeping here. Although we were we bought another home, and my son, middle son, and us were living in that home. But in the evenings, we'll be here mm. just you know, because there were, there were things here. Yeah. And so it, it took um, almost uh, a year and a half of um, construction after I lost the election. And we moved here in December of 2012. Okay. We'd moved out of here in 2010, moved back in December 2012. And um, then uh, I started thinking like, you know, I'm out of electoral politics. I am um, done with the building. Uh, so I would drink at night and have something to eat and go to sleep and wake up in the morning and go to sleep there after reading the newspaper on the sofa, right? I said, you know, this is kind of ugly. I mean, life has to be better than this, right? So, and, and, I, and I missed the cut and thrust of the debate. I didn't miss the politics. I didn't miss going to meetings, didn't miss the opportunity to speak. Yeah. Just the cut and thrust of debate. So I started, uh, I asked a friend of mine to buy me uh, a computer. He bought me a computer. I started writing a blog. Somebody set me up a blog, org. So I must have done a couple of hundred blogs like, by now. And um, So what are they focused on? Are they politics, politics, events, politics. Um, here, India, 
viewpoints, yeah. commentaries, yeah, 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 yeah. opinion pieces. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and you know, I mean, some of them have 60,000 hits. Some of them have 12,000 hits. I mean, some of them have 200 hits. I mean, they're, you know, different, right? Um, I would write about events that kind of um, uh, interested me in the community, in the larger society, about politics, not politics. And that kind of got my intellectual arteries going. And um, uh, um, one of the publishers, um, uh, Douglas McIntyre, had been interested in me doing uh, my autobiography. And I started talking to um, Scott McIntyre um, and we agreed and we were discussing. And you know how yeah, here you have to subsidize, uh, unless your autobiography is going to sell like 10,000 copies, you subsidize them a little because they don't make much money in yeah. publication, you know that. So we were just chatting about like how much they would put in, how much they would acquire from me. And then we were in interviewing ghostwriters, journalists, like Daphne Bremen, and we, we interviewed a few people. And um, and then Douglas McIntyre went under yeah. and bought out by Howard, okay. Howard White. And, uh, and so there went that issue. And I was still doing blogs. And then my wife kept saying, why are you looking for ghostwriters? Like, you can do... You can write so well, like, why aren't you doing this? Yeah. Right? She'd seen me writing people's essays, like, in two hours or something. Right? So I said, okay, this is back in the university. Yeah, back at university. <laughs> so, uh, and then, and then, you know, then one day, Bob Ray was here. Uh, he, he was doing his tour. He was the leader of the Liberal Party, interim leader, right? He was doing his tour. He was leaving. And they wanted to honor him. They said, look, we come to your home. So about 50, 60 people were here. And Bob was here, and you know, having fun. And Rami complained to him and said, like, you, you tell him. Like, tell him that, you know, get his ass into the room and write, right? So Bob kind of, they both brought me here. And this was set up like this for, <laughs> for, for, for blogging, right? And uh, he said, put your bum there and write. Just, you know, like uh, between friends, and I, you know, I thought that made me think really that that maybe I should, right? The first paragraph of that autobiography was the most difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Once I put down the first paragraph, once I said, "I exited my mother's womb on such and such date," but it was like I wrote hundred. No, 200,000 words. It took me over a year and a half to write. And then, and Douglas McIntyre, uh, Scott McIntyre had said to me, he said, look, I feel so bad. I want to find you a publisher who will do your autobiography if you ever do it. Um, so I then called him up. I said, look, I've done this and I want you to take a look at it. Um, it was like that big. Mm -hmm. I still have it sitting here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, he took it home. We, we met at uh, Wedgwood for a coffee and he took it home. He said, I'm not going to read your tome. It's like, I said, I, I'll, I'll read some parts of it. I said, okay. Anyway, so he took a look and he said, there's a beautiful autobiography in this. It's going to need work and I'll find you uh, a publisher. So he talked to um, figure one. Um, publishers and there were some of the people who used to work with Douglas McIntyre and they had set up this figure one uh, publishers um, and they you know I mean um, they would put in some money and they needed some money for you to put in some money and so we are we made a deal and I, I wrote the book and and the editor then um, told me to cut 50,000 words Okay. Right. And uh, and uh, so I said, uh, how many um, do you are you going to have? She said, well, 130, 140,000 words max. So I actually took out 50 easily uh, and, and I gave it to her and she uh, went through the book with me and I accepted all her criticisms and things, changes that she made. Such a wonderful um, editor. Um, and once that was done, it had good reviews. It was on the bestseller list for about eight or nine weeks in BC. Mm -hmm. um, it sold about 2,500 copies. What was the title? Journey After Midnight. Yes. Um, and um, so once that happened, I 
then began to think maybe I should write those two novels that I was going to write. Um, 20, 30 years In ago. 1983. Yeah, oh, 30 years ago. Yeah, and uh, and I said, you know, obviously, like, I can I can do it if people like my, my, my prose, uh, then perhaps it might not be such a bad idea. So I was about um, 100 pages into it mm. when this friend of mine calls, who's a Punjabi writer, and uh, says, I've been reading your autobiography. Man, I don't know. Sometimes I read it's like a poem. Sometimes I read it's like it's like prose, and and you know sometimes it's like fiction, right? Uh, you should write a novel. I said I'm already about hundred pages into it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and that was uh, Gandhi's Bastards. It's a novel that begins. It hasn't been published. It's due to be published sometime in the next couple of years. Um, it begins uh, with. Um, 19 early 1900s the first decade and ends uh, in 1977 after indira gandhi is defeated after the emergency it is about how people fight for freedom how they live through all of the freedom issues and the partition and then the aftermath and then the then the emergency indira's emergency uh, essentially how how uh, the many of them subsequent to Shastri in particular, after Shastri, how many of them didn't live up to the principles and the expectations of, of the Mahatma. Hence the bastards. Yeah, and hence the bastards. Um, so when I finished that, um, I showed it to my editor and my editor said, this is too long, 1200 pages. It's too long. You're not a Tolstoy. I said, I, I, no, I'm not a Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we, and then she said, look, cut it into half. No, 400 pages. Uh, I did. And uh, then she said, um, I will now get you in touch with a novelist. Uh, there's a beautiful novel in this. I'll get you in touch with a novelist who can uh, teach you a few things. Because I'd never read anything about novel writing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So I, she put me in touch with Shana Lambert who's a published BC author. And Shana then did a, a review and critique of the whole novel, uh, gave, me a, gave me some pointers, and then said, look, I'm not going to get you to rewrite the whole novel. I'll, I'll, under my guidance, I want you to do this chapter and that chapter first. And I did that and then said, okay, do the other pages up to 100. Yes. Um, and... I was doing that, and then her mother died, and she was writing her own novel. She took six months to four months to get back to me. In the meantime, I had read enough about novel writing. I had looked at Tolstoy, looked at Steinbeck, looked at principles, and, and I didn't even know uh, viewpoint what viewpoint was when I was writing my novel in the in the beginning, right? Um, so that's when I wrote The Past is Never Dead, waiting for Shana to um, get on with the other first novel. And, uh, and, uh, and so then I, then I got back to the first novel, Gandhi's Bastards. I completed that with, with uh, Shana's uh, help, up to 100 pages, and then I rewrote the rest. Uh, um, and then I was sending synopses and praises and things like that to, you know, a few publishers. So um, how, how did these books come to be published, the first two novels? Well, I had, I had completed the, the first three novels. Um, I approached a couple of publishers here, nothing happened. Um, and then I actually went back to my Indian publisher who had published my autobiography in India. It was published both in India and here by two different publishers. Um, and he's a progressive indie publisher uh, under the imprint of Speaking Tiger. And um, I called him, Ravi Singh, I called him uh, and I said, look, I have some novels. He said, uh, I, I said, I'll send you one because I, I thought um, the past is never dead, dead was the radiest um, uh, to go. I sent him that. He loved it. He said, I'm going to publish it. Uh, then I sent him. Uh, this other novel about the uh, the lonely under the maple tree about the Khalistani struggle here. Uh, and he said, that's great, I'm going to publish it. Uh, but I only gave him the Indian rights 
of that. Um, and then I finally sent him. I said, look, my first love is Gandhi's Bastards. That was the first novel that was in my head. Yeah. Um, and he said, okay, send it to me. And he looked at it. He said, I'll publish this too. So those three are in a queue to be published. Yeah. Um, the uh, Let me just tell you. Um, then what had happened was I was going back in May for the release of The Past is Never Dead. I wanted to write the sequel to Gandhi's Bastards. And that's God Says Children. God Says was the, the Gandhi's assassin. Mm -hmm. God Says Children are in control of India today. And uh, so I wanted to write that. So it took me four months to finish that novel. I finished it in April and I took it with me in May. And I gave it to my publisher. He said, I want to publish this first. Uh, so that is being published end of March, early April. And the other two he has, uh, the Khalistani one and uh, uh, the Gandhi's Bastard, he'll publish them sequentially at some point. Um, and the um, Lonely Under the Maple, about the Khalistani events here, uh, that is the one Caitlin Press, with your help, has agreed to uh, publish by the end of this year. Um, and and because uh, Ravi only has the Indian rights to it. Good. Well played. This is good. You planned your career and I don't know the course of your books. <laughs> no, this is good. It's so and good then, to see that. And then I have another novel that, that's still unspoken for. Okay. And that is a novel that I wrote on a whim. Others I had like historic others are pure historical fiction. This one I wrote on a whim. I, I suddenly had this image in my head of a young kid, four, 13, 14 year old, barefoot, short shorts and uh, short sleeve shirt mm. shorn hair um, uh, and walking a dirt road in a village near in Punjab near the Kashmir border um, in and, and his clothes shimmering with grime uh, and mm. so it, I just had this image in my head and I I just I wrote the image down in the first paragraph and I just it, it, it just happened. Uh, the plot just developed. I didn't have a plot in my head. It is called Of Men and Mirages. Um, and this kid um, discovers that that his father was killed from the village, allegedly killed by the the largest, the biggest landlord in the in the village. And and he is so hooked up on the idea of revenge. And the village is pushing him into this revenge. And it is a story, how the story develops and what happens and, and brings, how it brings to the fam families, bring, how it brings the families to the verge of extinction. This is your current project. No, it, it's done. It's done. And though, so a friend of mine has it, you know, Phil, you know, um, Pinder Dule. Pinder. Yeah, Pinder is just reading. I just gave it to him to read. And uh, Ravi has it, but he hasn't said anything. And it's not. It, it mentions history. It, it, when he then when the kid is 15 years old, India-China war had just ended, 1962. And uh, and so and then I had you know then I had another project in my head uh, about a chap who um, uh, was born and raised in India, lives a. a a very um, disreputable kind of life, mm. but ends up in Canada. Mm. But he's hooked up on, he's hung up on, on the idea of um, a cremation, because he his parents were killed when he was very young, and he didn't even remember their cremation. But he remembered when his nana told him that he was standing there, so he remembered the embers flying from the fire. That's the only thing, and doesn't remember human beings around. And so he is hung up on the idea of cremation. And every time something happens in his life, he sees embers flying, right? And he comes to Canada, and then he's going to die here, and he's going to want a cremation. He's not, not going to get it. Open air cremation. Open air cremation. So, so I, I, he's, a, he's a dislikable character. But I, I'm focusing on this idea that that even the worst human beings have have desires and homesickness and things that they miss yeah. from where they lived. 
and uh, so he's going to die in Canada without a without an open air. You're, you're giving away the ending of the book. Uh, that's just okay. You 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 can you can you can you can, you can <laughs> delete it. <laughs> I'm telling you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's let's take our. Um, I can't stop it's, writing. It's just like yeah, that it becomes natural then. Um, this becomes your focus of your life. Um, do we, so now? Do you see? So you see this as your career now, as your prime career, and you know, I, I don't, and I do. I mean, I, I don't have another career. Right? I mean, I'm I am who I am, and I'm retired, and that's my career. Actually, I'm retired. Um, this I'm doing. I, I always thought. It's not enough for a human being to sort of disappear from this earth after saying, okay, I was this, I was that, I was a lawyer, I was a father, and then I became a premier, and then I became a minister of health, and like, so what? Right? And I thought, there has to be something more. And then I, um, and then I read Marcel Proust, uh, who basically said that art is what survives. And by then, I was already into writing Gandhi's Bastards, and uh, and and I I believe I so it's not a thing of vanity for me, but I wanted to leave for my grandchildren a different kind of legacy, a fuller legacy, not just a legacy of okay he was the Attorney General, he was the Premier, it's like, yeah. but a legacy that kind of you know a human being is not just one thing, right? Yeah. We are many things. Yes. I'm an activist, mm-hmm. I'm a writer, I'm a poet, too, but I write Punjabi poetry, mm-hmm. I write novels, right? I love driving my grandchildren. So so that they get a sense that there's a human being. Fuller human being than just their grandpa or former AG or former premier. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been an excellent, excellent discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope to come back. Uh, sometime and uh, do a follow up in which we can discuss the books that have influenced yeah. us, especially yeah. you what, and yeah. what you're reading and all. Yeah. That. Yeah. But thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. So, you, what what are you reading? The the past is never the dead. The novel, the past is never dead. Okay. The first to be published. Prologue. Sorry. Our ancestors would slaughter you people at the altar. Our orders were to kill you, remember that, said the voice, as if they had done him a favor by letting him live. That voice, the only voice that had spoken to, or rather at him, had constantly hurled obscenities for what seemed like two days now. The vehicle in which they traveled sounded and felt like a small delivery van. It eventually dumped him on a gravel road as the voice had instructed its companions. After a few minutes of lying inert, counting to 200 and not to 1,000 as he'd he'd been told, he removed his blindfold, opened his eyes and realized he was several miles away from home. In the dark and cold winter night, he walked through the fields, bushes and across shortcuts. His limbs were near frozen. He found the payphone he had remembered seeing earlier once by the road he was on now and called a taxi which took him home to 2 St. Leonard's Avenue, Bedford. Once in his room, he wrapped himself in blankets, sat on his bed and looked out. Across the street, beyond the four-foot-tall brick wall, stood the deserted St. John's Railway Station and a red telephone booth near its entrance. He used he had used the telephone three there scores of times. His ears remembered the clanking of the coins falling through the slot. The steadily falling snow appeared less than white, discolored. The station lamppost shone dim, much dimmer than usual. He prayed for a storm, a rainstorm, typhoon, earthquake, snowstorm, any storm, anything, something to wash everything away. After a mysterious disappearance of over 24 hours, he had just returned home. Everything all right, son? Can I come in? said Udo after knocking on his bedroom door, his voice muffled. Kalu heard the lump in Udo's throat. He jumped out of bed and locked the door. No, Papa, I will see you in the morning. I've already told you, everything is all right, 
he said, clutching the doorknob tightly in his right hand. His head touched one of his turbans hanging by the hook on the door. His body trembled as he turned to look at the mirror on the dresser. He thrust his clenched fist into it. The mirror cracked, but no shards fell off. Son, what was that noise? Everything all right? Kalu put his hand on his heart, afraid his father would hear his agitated pounding. He knew his father hadn't believed a word he had said. The countless fragments of the fra fractured mirror reflected his naked body, dissected by the cracks. His hands moved from his heart to his head. The touch felt odd to his hands. He looked into the mirror again. It showed no hair on the face, the head and the rest of the body, except at the crotch and some by the armpits. His legs bobbled under him. His hands moved to feel his neck and its hair less small. He noticed the marks of the turban on his forehead. His facial skin that normally hid under his turban was lighter compared to the darker brown on the rest of his face. The black birthmark on the left side of his forehead stared at him. Without the sick turban, the hair on his head and the beard, the birthmark was visible and his chamar hood felt exposed. In the corner of his eye, he could see the solitary bulb hanging from the wire on the ceiling. He thrust his fist into his eyes and turned away from the mirror. When he dropped his fist, his eyes opened to a portion of the wall above the headboard. Framed portraits of Ravidas and Ambedkar, deemed deities uh, for the untouchables, looked down at him. In the dim light of the ceiling bulb, they looked anything but godlike. The garlands around their necks reeked of mortality, like noses, nooses, they screamed death. Kalu's eyes turned to the small frame black and white photo of Udo on the bedside table. He seemed to jump out of the frame dressed as Kalu had remembered him in 1942. Thank you. Thank you. So this is uh, my autobiography, Journey After Midnight. Um, the um, paperback now republished in India with a different title page. <laughs> um, I'm going to read you the... Uh, couple of paragraphs from the beginning um, and then I'm going to move to another chapter and read you another couple of paragraphs. Yeah. I was brought into a world in turmoil. The Allies had decisively defeated the fascist Axis armies but the world had witnessed the first atom bombs fall on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Several million Jews, half a million Roma and innumerable others had been killed by Hitler. The League of Nations was consigned to the history books and the United Nations had been launched. A victorious but weakened Britain was in the midst of leaving India. Dusanj Kala, the village in Punjab where I was born, had been settled by my ancestors about 500 years earlier. Dusanj is like most Punjabis are believed to have traveled initially from Rajasthan. My ancestor lived a few miles away in Pwadra before moving to a new spot to create the Sanj Kalam. From a recent study of last names published in a major Punjabi daily, I discovered that a minor princeling in Rajasthan had five sons, the Sanj, Malli, Teen, Saz, Sangha and Taliwal. Since then, we the Sanjis have grown to number several thousand in India and across the world. Of course, the Sanj was a first name at a time when people in India usually had single names. So perhaps princelings were not the only fathers to name their sons the Sanjas. Uh, so though some of us lay a claim to royal lineage, I make no such claim. I have no doubt I come from the untainted peasant stock, people of the soil, who through the centuries worked their small plots of earth to eke out the most meager of livings. Mm. Um, I'll now read you the almost the second or third last chapter. Um, a variation on the common Indian expression, Mulla the Dor Masid Tain, which roughly translates as an Imam's ultimate refuge is the mosque, sums up my relationship with, with the world. India is my Masid. I have lived as a global citizen, but India has been my Mandir, my Masjid and my Girja, my temple, my mosque and my church. It has been too my Gurdwara, my synagogue and my pagoda. Canada has helped shape me. India is in my soul. 
Canada has been my abode, providing me with physical comforts and the arena for being an active citizen. India has been my spiritual refuge and my sanctuary. Physically and in the incessant, incessant wanderings of the mind, I have returned to it time and again. Most immigrants do not admit to living this divided experience. Our lack of candor about our schizophrenic souls is rooted in our fear of being branded disloyal to our adopted lands. I believe Canada, however, is mature enough to withstand the acknowledgement of the duality of immigrants' lives. Mm. It can only make for a healthier democracy. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much.